The following program is a special presentation of the Big Ten Network, produced in association with the University of Wisconsin. There's cool and then there's jazz cool. When you play with Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, or Sarah Vaughn, you've got chops. Up next, we'll meet a Wisconsin professor who may have the corner on cool in this very chilly state. A world-renowned bass player, our guest came to the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1977 from the jazz clubs and sessions of New York and brought a Buick Electra full of rhythm licks and classical technique to the musical school. Richard Davis then took his zeal for bass, his love of teaching, and a passion for racial understanding as, and has created something very, very special here at the UW-Madison. And Richard Davis, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Great Sam. to have you here. Pleasure. Southside Chicago. You don't think jazz, you don't think classical bass, you think blues. How did you become a bass player? Um, you know, what attracted you to the bass at a young age? Well, walking through the alleys in my uh, neighborhood, there was always somebody up on a porch wanging away on a guitar. Yeah. Usually with a metal cap from a sure. whiskey bottle. Little slide. And twanging. Yep. Yeah. You heard it every time. So when did you first pick up a bass? When I was 15. And were you formally trained? I had no training in music until I was 15. Started and, with the bass. And um, was there an artist or a song or a performance that made you sit up in your chair and say, I'm going to be a musician for the rest of my oh, life? Oh, yeah. That was a lot of that neighborhood. Many saxophone players. The neighborhood was full of music. What Chicago neighborhood? Southside? 47 and Champlain Avenue. Okay, okay. 600 East. It's just music, music, music all the time. When did it dawn on you you could make a living doing it? Because it's one thing playing on the porch. It's another thing to play to eat. My parents taught me not to worry about those things. They said, the thing you need to worry about and do is be the best. And if you are that, things will come to you. You make it sound like your neighborhood forged um, your career, but you're classically trained, jazz, a very disciplined, accomplished artist. When did you go from, I have a passion for this, to I am consumed by this, and I'm going to study it, and I'm going to make, my, make it my life's work? How did that process work? I was consumed by the first day that I thought I should play the bass. I had a cousin, female cousin, who encouraged me to play the bass. And I kept talking about the bass, and she says, why don't you play it? I never thought of that. Right. So then she bought me my first music book. That was in 1945. I still have that book because she was a, a great artist. And I said, why don't you play the bass, <laughs> since you like it so much? She said, women don't play bass. And I hated that, because mm -hmm. I knew if she had become a bass player, she would have been great. But in those days, they would stamp women down to second-class citizens, and somebody decided they shouldn't pay the bass. At that time, you were born in, in 30, um, but in that time, there weren't people teaching jazz bass, right? Did you not teach yourself uh, jazz bass uh, by playing with other artists? There wasn't formal jazz training. I can understand perhaps classical training, but jazz was just breaking out, you know, in, in the 40s, it, you know, the, the kind of jazz you played, the club scene, the New York scene, the Miles Davis scene, there wasn't a school for that, was there? I understand what you're saying. But if you look back in history, uh, Cootie, not Cootie Williams, but Jimmy Lunsford, mm -hmm. Erskine Hawkins, Andy Kirk, and all those guys were in a college band. Oh, okay. It formed while they were in college. Right. And they were teaching that and others to play. Right. It wasn't until in the 40s when Stan Kenton mm -hmm. came on the scene where they started putting it in the classroom. Gotcha. But it's usual that the history of black people gets lost. Right. It doesn't get the, the, what it deserves. So they go to Stan Kenton say he did it. Right. And Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck was very popular in uh, school systems. Right. 
but he would always say and tell about the black musicians who started in the forties. But it's I, no it's no secret that uh, jazz and R&B came from black America, not white America, and then white America jumped on the train. Um, you were in the you were in the the jazz scene during the Miles Davis era in New York. Billboard magazine had you as the top bass player from the 60s through the 70s, uh, something like 12, 13, 14 years in a row. That was downbeat. Oh, downbeat, excuse me. Yeah. Um, was Miles Davis the leader of the pack during that time? Was, was he setting the tone for everything that was happening? Well, I like the way you said that, because he did set patterns for not only music, cars, clothes. Style women, <laughs> political things. Mm -hmm. He's the one that uh, said he was not going to work from 10 to 4. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to work six, day, seven, six days a week, mm -hmm. seven days a week. He said, I will come in, I'll play a set, maybe a second set on weekends, and I am not going to go by what you're saying. I'm the one people are coming to see. They don't even know your name. How was he to work with? Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful to work with. He had an enigmatic reputation in terms of his relationship with the audience, correct? Oh, yeah. But the musicians are always cool. Miles is one of the pace setters of what cool is. Do you miss him? Very much. I bet you do. Yeah. I bet you do. People thought we were related. How so? I don't know. Just the way you connected when he on died, stage? One or? of my students walked up to me and said, I'm sorry to hear about your uncle. Well, <laughs> well, here's another uncle of yours that's going to play us to bump um, some of the University of Wisconsin uh, students who uh, are pupils of uh, Professor Davis are going to play a little Bach for us as we go into bumper. We'll be right back with Richard Davis. Stay with us. This production of Wisconsin Reflections is produced by University Communications at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. For more than 100 years, the University of Wisconsin has been inspired by the Wisconsin idea. Which says the good work of the university extends to the boundaries of the state and beyond. So the UW works hard to help build Wisconsin's economy. Educate people of all ages. Advance health and medicine. And enhance the quality of life for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Hey, we're back. We're in Madison, Wisconsin. And we're with Professor Richard Davis, uh, world-acclaimed bassist, great teacher. Um, and check out these uh, credits. John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen, Barbara Streisand, Stravinsky, Dizzy Gillespie, Frank Sinatra, and some that I like, Milt Jackson, Joe Williams, Johnny Hartman, Sarah Vaughan. Um, these are all folks that needed Richard to make them sound good. Um, can I start with Ben Webster? Oh, man. You one of my favorite artists of all time. He could not have started any better than Ben Webster. Beautiful, thanks. What was it like working with him? Because listening to him breaks your heart. 
Well, I'll give you a little history of how I listened to him. I started playing bass in 45. This great bassist who I admired died in 42. I began to write to his mother. Her name was Jimmy Blanchard. And I was listening to uh, Duke Ellington's band, mm -hmm. that band of 1939-1941, which is considered the best band Duke had because he had this stellar bass player who revolutionized bass playing, and he had Ben Webster, who was his first real tenor soloist. And as I listened to Blanchard, I was listening to this incredible sound on the tenor. And I, right today, I can sing every note he ever played in any solo. And Ben Webster, for those of you who don't know, is a saxophone player. Who oh, is, man. Uh, and you, can I just tell you how I got to him and why people are more into music, the albums that you've been on? If you type in Richard Davis on iTunes, you get a lot of Miles Davis sessions that you were on. But then if you wiki you, Wikipedia you, you get Ben Webster and all, all these other folks. But uh, also Johnny Hartman and Joe Williams. People have a tendency to focus. Both of them from my hometown. Re yeah, yeah, Joe Williams, who just passed within the last couple of years. Um, they, there's a tendency to identify Springsteen, Barbara Streisand, John Lennon, some of the pop rock artists you've played with. But some of the seminal jazz artists, uh, you know, are, I think, kind of making a comeback because people can access the music a little bit more now online than they could in the record store. I don't know, I mean, are you, have you been never, made aware of that? I can never leave this studio if the name of Eric Dolphy is not mentioned. Right, right. Now, getting back to Ben Webster, I'm 15 years old. This guy must have been about 30. Yeah. While I was listening to him. And in New York, I am playing with him. I could not believe that I was on the same stage with Ben Webster. Did you think you'd made it then? Was that the I made it moment? I never thought I had made it because that's kind of a transformational. Yeah. I haven't made it yet. Frank Sinatra, did, did he sing live in the sessions no. where you played with him? No. So he, you laid down the tracks? Yeah. You know, because you you're from an era, you, you worked in studios where all the instruments were live. There were not a lot of multi-tracks necessarily. Were there times when some of these artists were in the session with you? Oh, yeah. And, and Sinatra would say, Davis, pick it up a little bit or jazz it up a little bit. Or do you know, I mean, did you have any relationship with these guys? Or was it all was, through the arranger? <laughs> I probably would have had to say that to him. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably true. <laughs> I like uh, the way you interview. Well, oh, thanks. Well, you know, he probably said, help me jazz it up a little bit. No, right? he, uh, he thought he was cool. He was. He was okay, cool? Oh, he was cool, man. Yeah. John Lennon. What'd you work on with Lennon? I don't know. See, when you record as a studio recording musician, right. you work from 10 to 1 and 2 to 5 and 7 to 10. It's a day job. Between that, you're doing jingles and right. pingles, lingles and all these commercial things. You know, you also you, recorded, worked on the Born to Run album with Bruce Springsteen. Did you know that? Yeah, I found that out recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, what was the most challenging artist you ever worked with? Wow. I was just beginning to like you. <laughs> well, I, I'm not, no, but I'm not saying like someone you didn't like. I'm just saying, I man, know. this person's doing something musically that is pushing me. I'm not saying, I didn't say who did you not well, like with or who did you like with. That would be disrespectful. I know exactly what you're saying. But it's like, man, I'm outside my comfort zone with this. I know exactly what you're saying. I'm trying to go back and realize what it is. But Oliver Nelson, Oliver Nelson wrote one of the hardest bass parts I've ever seen. And Oliver Nelson was one of the gifted conductors. And was he a performers? Classical? I don't. I, I don't know all for Oliver Nelson. I'm sorry. Oliver Nelson is known in the jazz world. Okay. Okay. And he was one of the most skillful persons I ever worked with. And uh, he wrote something called Blues and the Abstract Truth. Then he followed it up with blue, more blues and the Abstract Truth. And then so he made you part, work. <laughs> I'm going to show you guys that part <laughs> next week. Uh, and you know what? We're going to show you uh, some of Richard's students playing a little more Bach, and we'll be right back. This is fun.
Consider this. There's a public university that consistently ranks among the top in the number of Peace Corps volunteers and in the number of graduates serving as CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, whether they are leading corporations or changing the world. The next time you see people doing extraordinary things, they are probably badgers. The University of Wisconsin-Madison. Forward thinking. Hey, we're back. Um, we're in Madison, Wisconsin with Professor Richard Davis, and there's never more appropriate uh, time to call the Com, Com Arts Building uh, studio the basement because we have some great bass students here, and Richard Davis is one of the world's most accomplished bass players. So you're a great session guy. You're working with all the big names. You're making a good living as an artist, and you pack up and you move to Madison, Wisconsin, of all places, way out in the Midwest, <laughs> way out in the Midwest, and decide to become a teacher. Why? Well, Martin Luther King said, gaining knowledge is one thing, imparting it and sharing it is even more than one thing. And I believed in him, and I felt that I should share what I had learned with the next generation. As a teacher, what have you learned? Well, first I learned how to teach. <laughs> <laughs> Which is no small thing. You learn how to teach because I always say that a mother does not know how to mother until she has a child and child makes demands and does not speak the same language she's speaking. <laughs> yep, yep. She has to know what is needed by feeling that bond and there are things that I've done so naturally so much naturally over the years that I don't realize that I've done it or I can't demonstrate until I see a need to show right them what might be an improvement on their playing what you take the base and I say oh you have to do this mm -hmm. but now until I take the base say, oh you have to do this and the thing that I try to get over to them is that nobody really taught me that I imagined right. what to do. Right. And I wanted them to do the same thing. Right. And if I don't teach them to be better than I am, I'm not teaching them. We live in a world of beatboxes and garage band and synthesized music. Um, is this generation of musicians um, different from the musicians you grew up with? And if they are, how? Wow, that's a hard question. They are different. Uh, but that's what they said about us. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. They're different. Yeah. How and are they different? In what way? Well, anyone of you guys want to answer that question? <laughs> because, Bridget, you ha can you answer that question? Sure. Um, you know what? We'll go to the audience and we'll ask them to answer yeah. that question. Yeah, um, because I don't see any difference. Uh, when we talk about uh, hip hop and rap and all that yeah. stuff, man, we did that on the street when I was 15 years old. So everything is old as new again. That's it. It's recycled. Yeah. It modifies itself. It comes through another period in time. It's all the same. We used to signify on the streets every day, and that's what the the rappers are doing. They yep. signify. Yep. Talking about everything. Did. You were at, in New York, during the height of the jazz era, when Hugh Hefner was listening to jazz. And, you know, jazz was, for a brief moment in time, in America, the musical style in the late 50s into the early 60s. And then these rock and roll kids and these British kids came over. And my question is, do you feel like rock and roll and the British Beatles invasion and kind of killed jazz a little bit? Did it, well, did it stop its run? There's two sides to that story. It might have, to some degree, but the thing that made jazz diminished in its popularity was during that period in time where the music was protesting mm -hmm. civil rights. Right. And so people became afraid of the jazz musician because he looked like what and how they look at terrorists today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the music evolved because of different periods and decades. 
The revolutionary music was bebop. Right. We don't want to play any white person's music anymore. Right. We want to get the royalties ourselves. Let's talk about that a little bit more when we come back from break. Sure. And I think one, at one time Bach was uh, viewed as a rebel too. So let's listen to some more of him. <laughs> We're back in Madison, Wisconsin with Professor Richard Davis. And Professor Davis said there was a time in, in, the, in jazz history where the artist looked like this during the 60s, and it was a little, it made audiences a little uncomfortable, and um, maybe that's okay. Um, racial understanding and healing is a, a, a theme that runs through your teaching as well. You've been a leader in um, uh, uh, helping uh, folks in Madison get their arms around the diversity issue for the last 25 years. Uh, last week, Barack Obama became President of the United States, was sworn in as President of the United States. Um, do you think some healing happened this year? Yes. How so? Well, first of all, institutionalized racism doesn't really permit people to be free enough to get the best medical care, to get the best schooling, you name it, to get the best uh, justice, social justice, and it's a ray of hope when you see a person like Obama being made to lead the country. Now, how much power he have in leading it it remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. So the effect of the healing process is hard to account for because you don't know who is being healed, who is being, uh, f who feels good about it, who does not feel good about it. And you can't do that properly without taking a consensus. You were on the ramparts for, in the um, move for social justice during the 60s, and certainly you've been a, a voice for it here on campus. Did white America surprise you in this last election? No. Because when you look at white America, you really can't tell who was an ally of the truth of fairness, who isn't? We have many, many, many whites who are for social justice. They're not broadcasted as much as the ones who are blatant racist. Mm -hmm. I give them a lot of credit because they've given their lives for that. You think of Viola Liuzzo? in Birmingham, mm -hmm. when she wanted to take a black man to vote, the chef of the town came up in his car 
stopped her car, aimed the gun at her head, and shot her. So they're taking chances. Um, I don't know if I'm staying on track, but a lot of no, things I are. want to say. Um, uh, you know, you, you were born in 1930. You were born in a very different America. And you, and you, you know, I have to wonder how hotel accommodations were for you when you traveled as a working musician. There weren't any. Right. You, you know, weren't allowed to do that. Right. I mean, Henry Aaron couldn't stay in the hotels of the towns he played in yeah. when he played ball here in minor league in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, how were you affected emotionally when Barack Obama put his hand on the Bible? I felt very good. I taped it so I can play it over and over again. <laughs> Here's a brother who I knew he was cool when I saw him take his first stride. Mm -hmm. The way he walked, I say he's from the South Side. <laughs> 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 he's not trying to be white. Yeah, right. Some people get in that position, and they think they have to, you know, no. assimilate. I, I saw him take that little dip in the knee. I said, man, he is cool. <laughs> well, he... there's a Democrat, and then there's a Chicago Democrat. That is, man. <laughs> uh, we're going to be right back. A little more Bach, if we could, folks. We're back in Madison, Wisconsin, at, uh, from the campus of the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Richard Davis. And Richard, you and I don't talk this segment. We just listen. Uh, please join us and uh, the University of Wisconsin uh, musicians here, bass musicians, as they play uh, Dark is the Night by Torchinsky.
Hey, we're back in Madison. Professor Richard Davis with us is with us, one of the great bass players in the world. And we're going to take some questions from our audience. And let's start with May. Uh, May, what's your question? Uh, well, it's for um, Professor Davis. Um, you said that you met Barbara Jason and you made, like, you helped her with music and stuff. And I was wondering, what was it like to work with her? Because I, I saw her in Hello Dolly, and I'm wondering if she's like that in real life. <laughs> <laughs> All happy and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, is Barbara Streisand always happy, Professor Davis? <laughs> always happy. <laughs> is that the... Well, and, well, she likes to talk to her. Easy going. Nice to talk to you. Nice to be around. <laughs> and when they're like that, you work harder for them. Pretty good vocal instrument, too, huh? Mm-hmm. Powerful voice. Yeah. Another question. Hi, what's your name? My name's Angela Wellman. Angela, what's your question? Um, I notice you have a black music on. Can you stand up? I'm sorry. Here we go. I'm stuck. Oh, she's stuck with her purse. <laughs> there we go. I noticed sorry, you Angela, go ahead. Thank your question. you. I noticed you have a black music ensemble. Could you talk about that and, and why a black music ensemble, please? It was uh, established before I came here. And I never asked a question. But I like the feeling that black something was on the campus. And uh, sometimes uh, in the concerts, you don't see one black person on stage. And people say, why do you call it black music ensemble? I say, because we're playing the music of black composers. Hi, your name? Jesse. Jesse, what's your question? Um, Professor Davis, um, you are rather precocious at 15 in this adult world of, of music and clubs and distractions and what jazz was Women. like at that time and alcohol and drugs and temptations. What, what is there in your character that enabled you to successfully negotiate all that? Not just negotiate, but succeed and, and come out and prosper and, and have this life that, that other people perhaps confronted by these challenges might look to. Good home training. Strict. Never, I never wavered back and forth. My mother and father taught me to discipline myself, and I believed in them because they were telling me things because they loved me. And if I'm to return that, I have to pass it on to the next generation by it going through me. I've met many people who are dope addicts, prostitutes, you name it. And I've always felt that I could help them. And I did help some of them. Thank you. Another question. Hi, Professor Davis. Um, as a teacher, I have challenges in working with my students to get them to a place where they can open their hearts up to people who are different than they are. And I'm looking to you in your experiences. How can you help us do that as teachers in trying to make a new type of teacher who's more open? to people so that everybody has a place at the table? Well, that's a good question, Terry. And I will talk to you about it as much as you want me to talk to you about it. And I will guide you along only to share what I've learned to do in my experiences to make that happen. It's a long, slow process. It can't be done overnight, not in one semester. And if some of your students graduate, before you've accomplished what you're doing, you're lay, laying out a track that the others will come. And I guarantee, whenever you put something out there that's very positive and from your heart, see, I, I know you, you do things from the heart. And they will feel that later on in life and come back and say, wow, I wish I had paid attention to you when I was there. Because they found out for themselves that what you're saying comes from your experiences and trying to prepare them for the world out there. So I can just say, keep doing what you're doing, believe in yourself. I, man, I give some of the harshest punishments. Yeah, wanna, yeah. And I worry about whether the students are gonna <laughs> come back that night. Where they gonna commit suicide? But it's a test. They always come back. And we're gonna come back. How's that for a segue? We're gonna be right back with <laughs> Professor Richard Davis. <laughs> 
But we can talk more about that. Hey, we're back in Madison uh, on campus at the UW, University of Wisconsin, with Professor Richard Davis, and we're taking some questions from the audience. Hi, what's your name? I'm Mary. Hi, Mary. What's your question? Um, for pr Professor Davis, um, what's your most memorable performance? What, which one do you remember the most, or which one meant the most to you? I have two. One was playing with the great composer Igor Stravinsky, and when he exited the stage, he walked by me and touched me on the shoulder. I haven't watched that shoulder in 30 years. <laughs> the other one was when I knew that I had bonded with one of the greatest musicians I played with, Eric Dolphy. It was a moment of realization that I had never experienced before, as if I had left this planet. And at that moment, I said, this is what it must feel like to die. <laughs> and I really didn't care. Tell us about him a little bit. You've mentioned him. Tell us Eric about him. Eric Dolphy, if you want to see a picture of an angel, look at his picture. Very angelic man. And his instrument was? He played three instruments, one as well as the other, flute, alto saxophone, and bass clarinet. And what he did on the bass clarinet was, I was told, was impossible to have done by other bass clarinetists. I've got to get that, some of his stuff, because I'm not as familiar as I should be. Hi, what's your name? What's your question? Hi, I'm Kerry. Richard, you've had a lot of success and a lot of accomplishments over your career, but I'm curious to hear about some of the challenges that you've faced and how you've overcome them. Uh, can you categorize what some of the problems might have been? Um, I can tell you about perhaps race, of course. Perhaps in terms of race, perhaps in terms of music, perhaps in terms of your life. Is there something you're most proud of or a challenge that you've overcome that you're most proud of? Hmm. See, he's one of my former students. <laughs> now he's my teacher because I have to find out what it is I can say in response to that. <clears throat> I think one of the challenges I've been faced with then, now, and in the future relates to my skin color. No matter how well you think you might be doing, somebody looks at you in a negative way. Once you learn how to love yourself more, you don't take whatever they put out personally. It's their problem. A great man wrote that in a book, Miguel Ruiz. Do not take it personally because it's really their problem. My challenge today is to get more white people into being an ally of civil rights, social justice, and all. I had a meeting last night, 20 white females. They want to know what they can do. I'm going to write them back tonight, as soon as I get out of here, and say, when you go into any store to shop, you say to the manager, do you do racial profiling here? <laughs> and he'll say, huh? <laughs> I mean, do you follow black people around your store? Because I have $100 that I like to spend in this store, but I'm not going to applaud and promote you unless I feel that you don't do that. Because that woman who is saying that to him, husband might be black, child might be black, friend might be black. And if we all stick together, once we know what the oneness of humankind is, we all are one and the same. One tenth of one percent different. That's the skin. See, we all come out of Africa. And we're all <laughs> going to come right out of this next commercial with Richard Davis. We'll be right back. <laughs> For more information.
information about the show or to be in the audience for future tapings, go to www.wisconsinreflections.wisc.edu. In the dulcet tones of his students, um, we'd like to thank Professor Richard Davis. What a great, fun show. What a joyous sound. Uh, thanks for coming on. My pleasure. And uh, keep playing. Thank you. Okay? See everybody on Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.